All right, Randina and Alex. Where are you guys from originally? Where'd you grow up? So I was born in Nebraska, Omaha, Nebraska, and I grew up in mainly in like Bellflower and Hawaiian Gardens, California area. Um, after we moved, because my mom, she got divorced from my dad after she found out he was cheating on her when he got deported to Mexico. I was like five years old. She wasn't paying the bills or anything. She was just going out partying and not really taking care of me and my brother. And my brother was trying to give me any of his food from lunch that he would save from school. So there was that. I was like really skinny when I was little. And then at Your nine- Your brother was trying to get you into, into a gang? No, my, not, not yet. Not, it wasn't until I moved to Hawaiian Gardens, like when a lot of my like people who I looked up to were getting related and like they were trying you know, to get me affiliated. But I didn't really join. I kind of avoided that type of nonsense because one of my greatest influences, like I call him my uncle, my Theo, my Theo Husky, he um, dropped out of the gang because I influenced him to not be a part of the gang anymore because I wasn't about that life. And he moved to Colorado, so I felt like I did a big impact right there, you know? And I tried my best to be a good person. And I was born in Anaheim, but grew up like in Hawaiian Gardens and Lakewood or by the Long Beach Town Center, kind of Long Beach, Lakewood, Cerritos, border of all those cities. Um, my parents put me in good schools. They put me in Los Alamitos from middle school up to high school. I even won prom queen. <laughs> but um, my, we found out my little brother had cancer when I was about 13. And, you know, I my dad has always been like heavily gang related and I grew up around that kind of thing in my whole life. And my parents were doing drugs. You know, when they found out my brother had cancer, they um, graduated from pills to heroin. I remember finding their um, needles in the trash can one day when I, I knew they were doing it, but when I found out that they were do, doing it like that, I, I knew things were, you know, going down a rough path. And after that, I kind of had to watch over my brothers more like as if they were my kids. And I grew up helping, you know, raise my brothers, cook for them, clean for them. I was pretty much like always doing things for them, helping them in school, helping them graduate. You know, my brother with cancer, unfortunately, after COVID, he didn't even get to graduate high school. But, you know, after high school was when I met Alex. <laughs> he was uh, working for one of my dad's friends that started coming over to the house. He was gang related. And that's how we <laughs> met. Yeah, like um, one of the friend that she's talking about, his name is Amador. Um, they call him Perico. He he uh he's gang related and like you know he he got me working again and stuff like that. So he he was like somebody who I looked up to, who like I felt was like a good influential gang related person. And um, me personally, my my the the definition of gangster that I learned is to look after your neighborhood. You know, look after your people not what gangster means nowadays, you know? So like, I look up to like old school gangsters. So um, like Pedrico, he got me working again. He told me that, you know, in order to live life, you need to have like a steady job and things like that. Cause I used to manufacture medical stents for brain aneurysms, but I lost that job when I went to jail and I stopped working and I started slacking off. And after I met um, her dad, her, her dad was like kind of like my like heroin dealer, you know, and like, because my heroin dealer was initially Pedrico and then went to her dad and then um, because he would pick up from his her dad so like met the top head I guess and then I met her and I was like really in love as soon as I met her as soon as like I like like knocked on the door and asked for her dad and she answered and I was just really happy to meet her you know and and then if that, her dad seemed to like me a lot and wanted me around a lot more often helping her out. And, and I would, and I, I was bringing money to the table. It wasn't until after her mom killed herself, that's when things started shaking up and her dad like stopped liking me because I guess he was seeing the reflection of his relationship right in front of him. 
He um, pistol whipped me because he started believing rumors from others who were jealous of me for being with her. I guess everybody wanted to be with her. Yeah, <laughs> there were a lot of people that were jealous and being someone's daughter, especially like as heavy as my dad is, like in the area where he does his thing or whatever, you know, he's got everybody telling him all kinds of stuff, but mainly a lot of people, a lot of guys that were just jealous or mad. I don't know, I don't know what it was, but you know, I didn't do anything, didn't talk to any of them. You know, I think it was just because they wanted to get some points with my dad or something by telling him this or saying that. Cause like, I was a good girl. I was in Girl Scouts for like 12, 13 years. I didn't do anything but go to school and come home. My parents wouldn't let me go anywhere. They wouldn't let me hang out with friends. I barely got to go to school events, but when I did get to go to those school events, I did have fun and I made enough friends and enough connections to where, and you know, my senior year, they voted me prom queen. You know, everything was good up until about after I graduated high school, things started getting really bad. My grandpa started dying. He had diabetes and lung cancer, and I was taking care of him for a handful full of years until he died. And then after he died, he left the house to my dad. But then um, my mom and dad ended up in jail because they got caught. Um, I guess they got caught with, with, with like some pounds in the car. They went down to Mexico to buy a car from somebody and got set up and ended up in jail, both of them for a year. And I had to take care of the house and the bills and my brothers and I wasn't getting any help. And I had to do it all by myself. And when they came back, everybody said that I wasn't doing anything and I hadn't helped. And if it weren't for me, they wouldn't even have had the house still. And it was all just for them to get out and they ended up fighting. My mom ended up killing herself, and now my dad's just running uh, rampant. Running He's running amok, and I, I don't know what, how it's going over there. I haven't talked to my brothers or any of my family in about like almost two years now. Upgraded to fentanyl. Her dad upgraded to fentanyl now, so I'm pretty sure he's shooting it. Um, and it's funny because like. A lot of the people from the hood, they like kind of fear my mom because like my mom, she put a lot of work in the hood. She's not gang related. Same but with my dad. They bo both our parents are are heavily known in the hood. Like and my mom, she used to like be a pimp and like she 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 was she's pretty well known and like people know know me because of my mom, and and due to that, like I under, I don't understand why like oh, such a switch up because everybody loved me and now everybody hates me. And it's it's so weird because seeing that happen, it, it's just stupid because why can't people just be so like friendly and like nice to people, you know, like why can't peace just exist? Like why, why do people just have to act like such such jealousy and envy for, for no reason? Like people who can't just be themselves. Like me, I'm myself every day, you know, and that's why she loves me, you know. And maybe if people started acting like themselves, like maybe they could have probably at least achieved something other than nothing, you know, and have to keep on envying everybody that they see around them, you know. And, um, you know, for, for mo most of my high school years, you know, I started, like I was in honors, you know, I was in, all throughout high school, I was in honors, but my only problem was drugs. I started smoking weed at, at like 12 after my grandpa died. And I was living in San Bernardino. I was paying my mom's rent for for a cool minute, you know. Like I was, I was selling her narcos and so much because she wasn't taking them. She was addicted to meth. And then after that, like um, after my grandpa died, I started smoking the weed and then started popping pills. And then after that, at 13, I started popping more pills. But then I quit because you know pills aren't really the thing to do. And then I upgraded to meth after you know a little my first heartbreak, you know, and. Um, I walked into the bathroom. I was going to Gar High School, and because um, I got kicked out of Artesia High School, and at Gar, I walked into the bathroom and I seen one person from Chivas, which is like enemies of Hawaiian Gardens. They were um, sniffing a line of of meth, and um, they asked me if I wanted some because they thought I was going to snitch them out, and you know they just wanted to see if I'd do it. 
and I accidentally sniffed the whole like whole because it was like a piece of paper folded in half, hundred dollars worth of meth right there, and I sniffed the whole thing on accident. And then I ran around the mile and I felt fine, you know. Like I told the the person was I told the person I was just like I'm sorry, I'll pay you back. He's just like pay me back by living, <laughs> you know. And um, after that, uh, I just got heavily addicted after I because I quit for a year of meth, and then after that, like. I went back to it after I started smoking it and smoking it is like the most heavily addicting way to do it. You know, I, my mom, she said like she didn't want me smoking it because of the fact that um, once you start hitting that pipe, you're not going to put it down. And that's true. Like, yeah, I never did put it down after that. And then after that, I upgraded to heroin after I got, started getting a little bit more depressed after I found out my mom had leukemia. I started heroin at like 18. And then after that, um, that, that somehow I like, kind of met her and then I quit heroin for like 10 days. But then she said that she doesn't, she doesn't mind that if I do it or not, you know, and... Um, I was already addicted, so like, how was, how was I gonna keep doing it and be with him and him not be doing it? Yeah, cause like, the way that her dad would pay me was like, like letting me live there. And like, I told her dad that like I would quit you know for his daughter and i did i quit for 10 days but like she would ha have me ask him for uh, my payment to be like you know the heroin and so i would ask him for heroin even though that like i'm not doing it he was questioning like why am i asking him for heroin if i'm not doing it and um and then like he kind of knew why he knew that like i was still giving it to her and like you know then i started smoking it again and um he didn't really like that uh after that, we kind of upgraded to fentanyl after her dad kicked us out because um, in the streets it's hot. It's easy. It was easier to find. It was cheaper, and I have really bad teeth. So yeah, I, I kind of started the same way like he did, just way later. Like he started at 13, messing around with drugs. I started like way after high school, probably like 19, like early 20s. And it started with my bad teeth going to the dentist and then they'd give me, you know, some antibiotics and some Percocets. And then they'd have me come back in a week for the next round. And after that, I just kept doing pills here and there until then I started um, messing around with the M30s, the blue uh, Fetty pills. And um, after my parents ended up in jail, there was just a lot of stress. I couldn't handle it and, and um, dope was easy money and there was a lot of it around me. So I did what I had to do to make some money and keep paying the house payment while also supplying like enough for my habit too. And till I was full blown smoking it like every day consistently and then you know, once you end up on the streets, even just for a little bit of time, more than likely if you're doing heroin, you're probably gonna end up doing Fetty too if it doesn't kill you. So I ended up doing Fetty because it was easier to find. It was way cheaper and and here we are. <laughs> you know, I tell my dad, you don't want me doing Fetty, then help me not be on the streets. But instead he kicked me out on the streets and talked shit about doing the same shit that he's doing. He tried to keep me away from it my whole life, and I, I stayed away from it most of my life. But, you know, there's some things that that just can't be... Can't be undone. Yeah. You know, like, like me, homelessness started at like nine when my mom moved back out here. She had a bad boyfriend. He stabbed me three times, like right here in my chest, um, because like he... Um, he tried to sell me to this heroin dealer and I stopped like I was just playing Mortal Kombat and like then there's heroin dealer comes out and whips his whips his dick out and then after that I stabbed it and then after that like he hears this heroin dealer screaming he comes out and then after that he just stabs me three times and I I'm surprised I didn't die. How old were you? I was nine years old and I'm 23 now, you know and. Um, and not only that, the other thing that he did was like one time me and my mom and him, we were in the car. And it's funny because I was like five years old or six years old when I had a dream. And like, um, I don't know if you believe in, uh, um, there's, there, I forgot what they're called. There, there are certain type of dreams. Yeah, premonitions. And like, I had a premonition at like six years old of seeing a cat like 
waking up to inside of the back of a car with a cat in front of me my mom arguing with some guy with like devil horn tattoos and then later on when i'm nine years old i see this guy and like I, i'm realizing i'm reliving that dream and um then I felt like I realized what they were arguing about. They were arguing about me like being hungry. And then I felt like he hit my mom. And then after he hit my mom, you know, my mom stopped the car. And then after that, he told me to shut the fuck up after I said, don't hit my mom. And then after that, he like tried to pull me out of the car, pull my arm out of socket. And then, yeah, just cause I was hungry. So like, you know, people are pretty fucked up, you know? And like, I learned that like, like most men are just shitty people, you know? And like, I try my best to not be bad man you know and um you know like throughout that time you know i was on and off homeless moving in with my aunt moving back out in the streets with my mom because i didn't want to leave my mom alone you know i had my best friend christian he's like more of a brother than my actual brother you know like i would always talk to him on the phone and then after i started living with my aunt for a little bit longer from like being like 13 and up like like up to 18 you know, like when I got, when I ran away from home at 17, my best friend let me stay at his house for a little bit until my aunt, you know, like she she really wanted me home because like I was trusting her out more after I found out my aunt had cancer. I, you know, this is my great aunt, this is my mom's aunt, you know, so like she she's like a she's like my mom to me. Like when it comes to like you know coming down to like the discipline and stuff like that, you know, me being like a gentleman and everything, I learned that from my aunt, you know. And um, my mom, she's like living with my aunt right now. You know, I, I got kicked out at 18 because, you know, I was heavily addicted to meth. And like, you know, um, she, my aunt thought that I was stealing from the house because I wouldn't snitch on my mom for like her stealing from the house. And like that caused me to get kicked out. And if I would have opened my mouth and said it was my mom, my mom would have been in the streets with a bad back and everything. And I would have been a shitty son for doing that, you know. And um, then I started living with my best friend, who's like my brother, and like he really wanted me to quit meth, but I couldn't quit meth. And then I ended up, you know, like, cause like I didn't want to break his break his heart any more than I already did, cause he's like my brother, and like you know, I didn't want him to have to feel like he has to push me away sometimes, cause like he'll see me high, and like he did, he wouldn't like me when I'm high, but you know. Sometimes he, sometimes he actually, when I would keep it quiet and not say anything about me, me using, he wouldn't know that I'm using and he would like prefer me like that. But then whenever I'm not using, you know, my emotions show a lot more cause like I'm a very emotional person and, and like, he didn't like that. He doesn't, he doesn't like being around like emotional people cause he's like more of a shunned in person. But, um, that's still my best friend to this day, you know, like if I was to go there right now and like ask him for help, he would help me. It's just, you know, don't want to want him to see me high anymore. So until I get sober, you know. Where are you guys staying now? You're on the streets? We're in the streets right now. Yeah, we, kind of anywhere. We bounce back and forth between here and Long Beach, kind of Hawaiian Gardens where our family is at. Mostly his, cause I don't really talk to mine anymore. Yeah, and I'm not, well, we try to stay away from Hawaiian Gardens because her dad has the whole hood looking for me, trying to kill me. I don't know about that. I think it's more just to scare you because if, yeah. I mean, like, it's because, like, Perico, he's, he, he, like, told me, like, her dad's, like, basically trying to kill me. So, like, I'm very, like, paranoid to be out there. My dad's just got a bad temper. I don't know, like after I graduated high school, I started taking care of my grandpa for him because he just couldn't handle seeing my grandpa like pretty much dying like that. And, um, you know, after my grandpa died was when he kind of, you know, took a step off the deep end. So did I, I started using drugs a lot more, started smoking a gang of weed and doing pills a lot more. And um, he started arguing with my mom a lot more. And then they went to jail and I picked up heroin and things were just, things were really rough. And, and I could barely afford to pay the bills and the house payment. It was, it was a struggle. I had no one helping me and my brothers were just looking down on me because they knew I was getting high. And um, my dad, I told my dad and he kept it a secret until 
There was a day where I made the money laid on his books and he threatened me that he got on the phone with my mom because I would pay to put money on the phone for both of them to put the phones together. And as soon as she got on the phone, he told her that I was doing heroin. And um, actually, surprisingly, she was more supportive and like just caring and wanted me to quit. Like, you know, she was more nice about it. And I stopped for a few, but then my brother started treating me real bad again, and I was the one that was doing everything for them, buying the food, paying the bills. <laughs> and um, so I started doing it again. And um, then they got out and they kept fighting. And my, my mom and my dad, they kicked us out on the streets for a couple weeks. And then we came back to the house and my parents were still fighting like more than ever. And I noticed like they hadn't been talking and my mo my dad noticed that my mom hadn't been around. And he, he asked me where my mom's at and then he went in the backyard to go find her. And she had a little shed back there where she hung out and did her own little thing, especially when they would fight. And he found her, she had hung herself. And you know, she, she had a hard life. She grew up on the streets like almost her whole life, kind of like same as him and her and her mom didn't have the greatest relationship and I think that kind of carried on with the way she treated me because we didn't really get along and, and I tried I tried to put effort there and, and it's just fucked up because, you know, the, those two weeks before she did what she did, like I hadn't talked to her and usually like when she's fighting with my dad, she'll come talk to me or say something to me because there's like untold things that she's said to me that she hasn't shared with anybody, including him. And like that just goes to show that it goes to show that I think that she did like really cherish the relationship that she had with me. She just couldn't, she didn't know how to, do, how to deal with having a daughter. She was just doing it the best way that she could, you know, like based on how she grew up and how she was treated. But it just makes me think like if maybe if I was there and they hadn't kicked me out, she hadn't yelled at me and told me to leave that night that maybe she would have talked to me or I would have said something to her and she'd still be alive. But, you know, I don't know. My dad, he just wants somebody to blame. He yells at me, tells me that it's my fault, that I killed her, you know, and they were the ones fighting, but it was obviously just a mental thing with her, I think. But, you know, it's just messed up because people say things and do things and, and they can't be undone. But yeah, you know, I think he carries a little bit of guilt. I think we all do. Everybody wants some somebody to blame or something to blame. But, you know, it's just the lifestyle, in all, really. In all actuality, it seems like your dad probably fucking killed her. But. I don't know. I think my mom was just tired. She's seen no end to this life. It's just, it's a life of, of just stealing and trying to make it to the, to the next bill or the next dollar or the next way you're gonna get money for that next fix or the food for the kids or whatever it may be but well for your dad stealing. now it's all it, all it is is partying and fucking trying to be a part of the gang more yeah i don't know i think he's like maybe having a midlife crisis i think especially after my mom did what she did he's just trying to look for a way out you know like it seems Any like he's upgrading to the cartel it's, that's what it seems like. It seems like he's upgrading to the cartel. Okay, My dad like, takes a lot of pride in this gang life, mm -hmm. and he just wants to keep leveling up. But I think it's like one of those things where he doesn't realize what he's doing until it's already done. A little background on Hawaiian Gardens. Like uh, um, the founding father of Hawaiian Gardens is um, the leader of the Mexican mafia. So it's very cartel related. It's very like very deep in that 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 whole Mexican gang related area you know then um, yeah it's a way it's they're it's well the connected. reason why this such a small city is so well known and well connected and there's things like drugs and gangs and all that and like um and in like people from hawaiian gardens are very well connected with like cartel leaders and stuff like that and so like her dad is like 
very well connected with cartel stuff. So like that's why I just made that theory that like you know he think he's like being a part of a cartel now because like the people he's been hanging around with, and yeah. Yeah, and I don't know. He loves it. He loves the lifestyle. He loves being on top. I don't know if it's just a, a feeling of him feeling like he's wanted or needed, but he. He or making a it. name for himself. You guys feel like the environment you guys grew up in, the families you grew up, you grew up in, kind of sealed your fate. Yeah, definitely. But yeah, a little bit. Yeah. I feel like there's like no changing. Like there's nothing I could have done to change what what was bound to happen. And so. me neither. If I would have done anything any other way, I probably would have ended up more fucked up. If I would have never met her, I would have died from a heroin overdose or definitely would have started smoking fentanyl. And like when I first did fentanyl, well, like the second time I did fentanyl, because the first time I did it, I was 18 and I didn't like it. I hated it. I honestly hated it. And um, I never wanted to do it again because I passed out and like I got $300 stolen from me. So I did it again after like she really wanted it. We come down here to downtown LA where she's telling me that like, oh, you could just go up in we a wanted, tent. Yeah, pick up. we were trying to get heroin, but we couldn't find it from anywhere and no one would sell it to us. We couldn't get it anywhere. And I knew down here, uh, Fetty was easy to get and it was cheap. You know, you could walk up in a tent and ask anybody for as much as you got or trade anything that you got. And then after that, like I did it, and then I went out multiple times. And um, she, she, if she was not there to Narcan me, I would have been dead. So if it weren't for me, if we weren't together, he'd be dead already, and I'd probably be sitting in the house, smoking my life away still by myself. What would you guys say is the most important lesson you've learned in your lives? Always be nice to, to, to always just be a good person and be who you are. Never change who you are yeah. for anything, you know. And be yourself and cherish the people around you for who they are. And um, always look out for the next person, whether they're looking out for you or not, because, you know, it'll life make will you feel give, better. Yeah, and life <laughs> will give it back to you what you put out for the most part. That's not to say that bad stuff bad things don't happen to good people and good things don't happen to bad people, but it's better to be a good person. And you never know, you could just make a big impact on somebody who's totally fucking evil. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Like, I changed the gang member to not be a part of a gang. And like, this gang is known for killing people who want to drop out, you know? And I made the impact to make him move and not be a part of it no more. And they respected it, so. Yeah, I think on that. <laughs> All right. Randina, Alex, thank you so much for sharing your stories. I wish you guys lots of luck out here. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much.